Hi. Hi there. How you doing? I'm okay. And you? Good. Welcome. What, what you doing? Oh, standing here, collecting dust. Let's start over. Hi. Hi there. How you doing? I'm doing fine. And you? Good. Good. What you doing? Well, standing here in the shed. Um, welcome back to another. First. <laughs> Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm doing good. How about you? Not too bad. What you doing? Uh, standing here, getting ready to tell you guys about uh, where we've been and where we're going. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, I guess we should say welcome back to. L.A. Fish Guys Aquarium Tech Talk. All right. Oh, see, you just knocked my light over there. Oh, yeah. We, we uh, talked about that one. <laughs> Welcome back to another part of L.A. Fish Guys Aquarium Tech Talk Calcium Reactor Edition. Hi, how are you doing? I'm doing good. How about you, Jim? Not too bad. Good. So, uh, it's... What are you doing out here? Uh, let's do that again. Okay. Because, yeah, you... Got you all flustered. <laughs> well, no, I know. You're like, it's all off, so it's like... <laughs> Welcome back to another part of LA Fish Guys Aquarium Tech Talk. Welcome back to another part of LA Fish Guys Aquarium Tech Talk Calcium Reactor Edition. How you doing there, Scott? I'm doing good. How about you, Jim? Not too bad. What you doing out here in the shed? Well, I'm going to show you guys what we've done um, and uh, talk about how things are going and where we're at. Okay, cool. So uh, how are things going? Things are going good. It's been about a month uh, since the last episode. Um, in that time, we've made a little bit of changes here in the shed. Um, and uh, we've also got the chemistry in the tank about where we need it. So first thing we'll do is cover what we've done in here um, and some of the issues that we faced during that period of time. Now this is about a calcium reactor. This is about a calcium reactor okay. and using a different pump technology to feed the reactor. Ooh. So uh, let's kind of talk about what we've done and what we've changed. Uh, first off, I got my new regulator. Um, we originally set this up. We had a different style regulator. This is the Aquarium Plants Carbon Doser Regulator, and what's unique about it is on a normal regulator, you got a little valve that you adjust, and then you pretty oh, much... Oh, those needle valves needle there, valve, they can yep. be frustrating. Exactly, and, and then of course you've got a bubble counter. Um, you got to open the valve and count the bubbles. What makes this unique is this little dial here. You can turn the dial, and, and essentially what it does is it adjusts the bubbles per second. So you've got graduated numbers here from 0.1 all the way up to 10, and what that represents is these numbers represent seconds. So one bubble per second, one bubble per two seconds, three seconds, four seconds, and so on and so forth. It basically eliminates the need of sitting there looking at the calcium reactor's bubble counter. Um, and it's extremely accurate. I do kind of remember when we set it up originally, we were trying to even get the camera angle back there to see it and watch the amount of bubbles that were going through it. Yep. With this solution, you really don't need to do that. It essentially uses a solenoid valve that clicks open um, and closed for a brief second. It's an electronic solenoid instead of the typical electric solenoid. Um, and there's a little microprocessor in there that, based on where this dial is, it'll open the valve, you know, X number of times per second or one time per X amount of seconds. So this unit has the ability to kind of monitor itself or, or is smart enough to know what's passing through it? Exactly. Whereas before the needle valve was something you just blindly opened and closed Correct. and used the actual bubble bubbles in the the counter to determine how many how much CO2 you're adding. Correct. And in the one other thing about this reactor versus those other ones it is pressure related. As the pressure um, decreases in the reactor, bubble size may change, um, which can affect the pH inside of the reactor. And right. maintaining stable pH in the reactor is pretty important. Uh, with this solution and a constant flow rate, what we find is we end up with a very, very stable pH. I mean, my pH in the reactor doesn't drift by much more than, you know, 0.05 over the course of a day or day. So I pretty much have a very flat line pH, which means that my apex controller that this is plugged into doesn't need to intervene. It, normally in a lot of setups you have a controller in there that essentially when the pH reaches a certain level, it turns on the power. It turns it on or turns it off. Correct. So when the pH drops so low, the solenoid would be turned off. And mm -hmm. when it's, you know, at the pH is up, so high, then the solenoid is open. Um, in this case, pretty much eliminates the need for intervention by the apex. I found that I can maintain a very, very stable pH with a combination of a decent regulator and most importantly, a feed pump or a pump to draw the water through. Um, now, speaking of pumps, when we initially set this up, we set the pump up 
to pull the water through the reactor and over the course of several days I noticed that I was collecting some air bubbles in here which led me to believe that there might be a slight leak um, at some point in the reactor was pulling a little bit of air through sucking this air thing. somewhere somewhere yeah so at that point what I did is I reversed the flow on the reactor um, so that it's pushing the water through when the you reactor. you say reverse the flow on the reactor, this one up here or the one down here? Well, the one up here um, is the second reactor. So uh -huh. essentially this is the primary reactor and the effluent from this reactor is fed into this reactor here. Right. Uh, you may also recall this reactor was set up on the floor. I raised it up here because air rises. So any gas, in this case it's in here that's expelled through the effluent line, goes uphill into here and then it's forced out of this reactor back to the tank. Um, so I raised this up so that air wasn't collecting at any one point, or in this case CO2. Uh, now this reactor of course acts as a, a degasser, it essentially helps to bring the pH in the water up before it goes into the tank and also helps to um, eliminate any CO2 or make sure that any excess CO2 is dissolved in the water and ends up, you know, and that reactor there has no intentional CO2 going into it. You're not counting or, or measuring anything going in there. No, That's just dealing with what came out of down here. Correct. And kind of acts as, a, I guess, a buffer, if you will. It, it you know, is another step in the uh, chain that helps to bring the pH back up. Because we're obviously dealing with a pH level in the reactor that is much lower than the pH level in my tank. And if we were dumping this reactor effluent straight into the tank with such a low pH, uh, it could impact. So, so I have to ask this question. The whole point is to drop the pH in the reactor, thus dissolving the gravel. Correct. Now, that dissolved gravel goes out the output line and goes through that reactor there. Correct. Um, and it's coming out of here as a low pH environment. That's right. what broke it down. That's what it made it into a, a liquid calcium, for lack of a better description. That is correct. So when it gets up here, you're trying to bring that pH of the water back up. Isn't that going to inhibit, uh, alter, uh, return um, the 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 water chemistry, in particular the calcium? Uh, not so much. Back the, to its original self. No, the calcium is dissolved in the water, so that is still in the water. This basically just acts as a buffer to help eliminate any excess CO2 in the water um, and balance more over the water out. Okay. If we use the, 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 the low pH to dissolve the, the media in the reactor um, and turn that into, you know, a basically, I want to say a liquid form, but it's basically particles within the liquid. Just because the, the, the uh, pH is increasing over here doesn't mean that those um, that the calcium and alkalinity from here is necessarily eliminated. You know, the whole idea is that, you know, even if it is reduced, if the alkalinity in here is reduced, the idea is to have the proper flow rate and proper um, balance in the system to supply enough calcium and the proper alkalinity to maintain a level in the tank. So, you know, regardless of what comes out of here, it's really a, about balancing flow and the proper pH in the reactor to get my system the levels that it needs. Geo's Reef, the fabricator of the world famous Geo Calcium Reactor line, has released a new dual chamber reactor. The CR612X2 is designed for hobbyists concerned with low effluent pH. Geo reactors utilize the bottom up water flow method to capture free CO2 and draw it back into the circulation pump. This design consumes less gas in the reaction chamber and less gas in the effluent. Not sure which reactor is best for you? GEO provides several different models. GEO reactors are fabricated in the USA. Check out geosreef.com today. Hello, my name is Jim Stein. I'm with Midwater Systems and I'm the developer of the Jelly Aquarium. The Jelly Aquarium is a tank designed specifically for the keeping of jellyfish. I offer five different sizes of tanks designed to be built into a wall or a freestanding cabinet. I also offer the inexpensive Mini Jelly Aquarium, which has its filter system built into its backside. Additionally, I offer tank-raised moon jellyfish, as well as a line of tanks designed for producing your own jellyfish. For more information on this fascinating world of keeping jellyfish, visit jellyquarium.com.
Okay, so three questions. The first one is you are not using um, the apex to run CO2. That's correct. I mean, the apex is involved. It is there as a fail safe, but it has not had to intervene. And, okay, it hasn't had to intervene. Why has it not had to intervene? Because we have very stable pH level inside this reactor. So you are, in fact, running CO2. Oh, yes. You are, running. in fact, dissolving uh, gravel in a low pH canister. Correct. Right now, we're keeping you know between 6.75 and 6.8 pH inside here, which is getting me a decent alkalinity and enough calcium to maintain a level inside my tank, my target level. So the reason you're not using the apex is the system's got itself dialed in. That's correct. The apex is involved. The apex does monitor it's the It's the failsafe. It monitors, but it's not running the system. It's not saying, oh boy, you better turn that uh, CO2 on. Has not had to intervene. Because it's kind of everything found a little sweet spot. It's it's kind of preset, and it, it's working within that little range all by itself. That's correct. I mean, in a normal situation where you've got a small pump in the tank water, this pumping water in here, and you're using a little valve, what happens is the effluent line tends to clog up. Right. As the flow changes, your CO2, or more importantly, not your CO2, but the pH in the, in the reactor could go down as the flow slows down. And that's where a lot of times you have a controller that's having to intervene. But because we've got a constant flow that's managed by you know, this pump here, um, the reactor's pH stays very stable. Okay, so question number two then is, have you done any testing on any of this stuff? Uh, well, what I've done is testing on the tank, and over the last month or so, I've monitored the tank um, from start to finish, from where we started. Initially, before we installed the reactor, I ran some tests to note that, number one, my calcium was low, my alkalinity Baseline. Was low. Right, to get a baseline. And so, before I implemented the use of the reactor, we dosed soda ash for the alkalinity and calcium chloride to bring the calcium up. Um, and, and we did some calculations, or I did some calculations based on water volume, and based on what my alkalinity and calcium was at versus where I wanted to go, I came up with a formula um, based on some online reef calculators. I did a series of doses to the tank. Um, end result is I did overshoot my target calcium, my target alkalinity by a little bit. For example, I was shooting for 420 to 450 calcium. I hit 500. I was shooting for 9.0 alkalinity or 9.0 DKH alkalinity and I wound up at 10. Not a big deal, they're safe numbers, but the end result is that before I could implement my calcium reactor, I had to let those numbers come back down. So what I did is, while the reactor was running, I disconnected the CO2 so that the pH in the reactor you know, remained neutral or remained what the tank um, pH was so that we weren't breaking down any of the media in there and we weren't increasing alkalinity or calcium. And I let it run that way for a week until the numbers came down low enough to where I felt comfortable running the CO2 and running the reactor properly. And part of my testing question comes back to, do you know what the pH coming out of that reactor down there is? I ran a test um, a couple weeks ago, and frankly, as far as I'm concerned, it really isn't very relevant to me. I'm concerned more about what the pH, or more importantly rather, not pH, but more importantly what the alkalinity and calcium levels are in the tank. I'm not chasing alkalinity and calcium levels on the effluent. I could drive myself crazy doing it. Again, at the end of the day, it's all about finding a balance in the tank. And if my calcium and alkalinity is too high, that means I need to slow the flow down, and at which point I could simply just slow it down here and adjust my CO2 input accordingly. Uh, if my levels in the tank are too low, then I increase the rate here and increase my bubbles per second to maintain a consistent pH in here. You know, we have certain media, different types of media, like this ARM media, for example. This stuff breaks down at about um, 6.7 pH. The reborn media, the little fishes, breaks down at a lower pH. They recommend a pH of about 6.4 to 6.5. Now, for the most part, I've got ARM in there, the larger granule ARM in there, and I've got a little bit of the reborn in there as well. So, I'm keeping my pH at the higher end. Right now, my tank doesn't use a lot of calcium, and it's not sucking out a lot of alkalinity. So, 
you know, really for me, maintaining a reasonable pH level in here, i.e. the 6.7 to 6.5, and a relatively slow rate, gives me enough output from the calcium reactor to maintain a target level that I'm after. And you, you, you know it's 6.7 down there. Correct. Well, I'm right now 6.75 to 6. .8. How do you know that? Because I can monitor through my apex. So my ah, apex okay. does keep track of the pH okay. in here, as I mentioned earlier. Okay. And, and I pay attention to that. And, you know, one thing I'll also note is we've had some weather changes here, and those weather changes have impacted the temperature in my tank. And when the temperature of the water changes, the pH level in the water might change as well, or more importantly, in this case, the pH level in the reactor. Colder water may raise the pH level slightly in the reactor, whereas when the water is warmer, I notice the pH level is a little bit lower in the reactor. Okay, so uh, we're going to go test here in just a moment. Next step is But I want to finish my third question, and that is I want you to show me the input and output of that reactor down below so that we can understand why you reverse the flow. Well, the reason that I reverse the flow, as I mentioned, is because I was noticing a little bit of accumulation of air inside the reactor, and it was consistent. I'd remove the air, and I noticed a little bit more air in there. So that led me to believe that at some point in here I had a vacuum leak. Um, as it turned out, I did. There was a slight leak um, at this valve here, which I come to find out. Um, my, my intent was, by reversing the flow, I would be pressurizing the reactor, and this leak would rear its ugly head. Well, it turned out there was a little bit of salt accumulation down here, which led me to where my leak was. I have yet to reverse the pump again, so it's still pressurizing the reactor, which, you know, at the level that I'm dealing with is just fine. So, so originally you were sucking water through it, now Correct. you're pumping water through it. Correct. Originally, the pump here was placed after the second reactor, was basically, this is the output line there. So the pump sat between here and there, and was sucking water from this reactor through this reactor and ultimately out of the tank. So now what we've done is we place this pump before this reactor here. So pump here, this line is drawing from the tank. This side draws from the tank and is pushing it through the reactor here. The reactor does its thing and the effluent line of the reactor then goes to the second reactor and then this line here ultimately goes to the tank. Okay. All right. If everybody understood that, we can maybe move on to the testing aspect. Yep, we'll go run a calcium test and an alkalinity test, and then I can kind of show you guys the graphs and you know what we've you know gone through essentially to get to where we're at.